for joining us this evening. Um, uh, as, as Randy said, I'm Richard Devlin. I'm the Acting Dean of the Shure School of Law. And I want, you, I want to welcome you to this webinar. A um, couple of things. Um, when I went to law school more than 40 years ago, the world was much simpler at that time. You'd basically go to law school, you'd get your law degree, you'd find a law job, you'd spend most of your life as a regular lawyer, usually often in the same law firm, pretty much doing the same sort of thing. Uh, for some people, they might go on to get a judicial appointment, but most people sort of stayed in the practice of law, pretty much doing the same thing uh, for most of their careers, and then they would retire. Uh, today, the world is much more complicated. The world is much more challenging. The competition to get into law school is much more challenging. Legal education is much more diverse and dynamic and interdisciplinary. Clients and their needs are significantly more complex. The job market itself is more complex. In many ways, we don't talk about lawyers so much, but we talk about the market for legal services. Uh, people frequently now move from one job in the legal marketplace to another job in the legal marketplace. They might some, stay somewhere for three, four, five, six years and then move on. So, it's, so our keywords now are no longer tradition as they used to be, but rather they're the keywords of innovation and flexibility. We're looking for people who are going to grow with the economy grow with society, so, social change, and respond to very rapidly changing social circumstances. So in light of this, legal education has not stood still. Legal education itself has been moving forward as well. So at the Shula School of Law, we have designed and developed four joint programs. These programs will give you double knowledges, they will give you double skill sets, and they will give you double competencies therefore enhancing your capacity to respond to the current marketplace for legal services. So these four programs are the JD with a master's in business administration, a JD with a master's in health administration, a JD with a master's of information, and a JD with a, a, a master's of public administration. And so this evening we got four folks from different communities to help come and share some of their thoughts on these programs and the career opportunities that await you hereafter. So I want to thank Randy for inviting me tonight and hope you have a, a wonderful evening. So take care and uh, if you have any questions, you've got a great panel of folks you have questions, who will answer your questions. So take care. Thanks everyone. Randy, you can mute me now again if you'd like. Thank you, Richard. Uh, apologies, as always. Um, so with us, as, as Richard said, we have a great panel uh, representing each of our combined partners. Uh, who are here to talk to you about kind of what you can gain from doing this and a little bit more about their individual departments. Uh, from the MBA, we're joined by Jenna Downing, who is a coordinator of recruitment. Uh, for MHA, we're joined by Michael Haskis, who is a professor here at the law school and also uh, works with the School of Health Administration. Um, with Masters of Information, the MI, we have Janet Music, who is Program Coordinator. And for MPA, we have Krista Cullimore, who is Program Manager for that. Um, as they're talking, uh, we will be uh, putting some information and that other contact information into the chat. So just keep an eye on there. If you have any questions, uh, you can raise your hand in the chat or just put the questions in uh, after everyone talks, we will be opening the floor up for questions. So first off, I'm going to open the floor to uh, MBA and Jenna. Awesome, thanks Randy and uh, thanks for having us here today. So I appreciate uh, everyone's time and the ability to get to tell everyone a little bit uh, more about uh, the MBA portion of the JD MBA joint degree. Uh, so our MBA program is a career launching MBA program. So it's a younger MBA program. Uh, it doesn't require work experience. So we have about 20% of our students come into the program with directly from their undergrad. Uh, the average student coming into the program is about less than two years work experience. And the average age is around 24, 25. So it is a younger cohort. We accept around uh, 45 to 50 students every year. And, uh, you know, it ranges 
every year about how many JDMBA students. Um, I believe we have about six uh, second year JDMBA students and then a few first year right now as well. So uh, we tend to have a handful of JDMBA students doing the joint degree. Um, through the joint portion from an MBA perspective, uh, we start in June of every year. So if, through the joint degree, you would start as an MBA student. Uh, you start in June of every year and the first two semesters are your core MBA courses. Uh, so you take them through those first that summer semester and then the first fall semester. Uh, so regardless of your uh, undergraduate degree, even if you don't have a business undergraduate degree, um, you're getting that core business uh, education at that master's level within those first two semesters. Um, so uh, also in addition through those first two semesters, you're also working with our career management service team to get prepared for our uh, corporate residency, which is uh, where our, our name comes from. So it's an eight month work term that happens um, following those first two semesters and it's eight months from January um, to the end of the summer. And it can be done with one of our employer partners from across uh, the country. Um, so we have you know, employer partners in the public, um, non-for-profit, non profit and uh, different sectors uh, where students can gain valuable uh, eight month work experience and they're treated, you know, it's more than just a co-op. It's not a four month co-op. Our employee partners treat you as employees and it's about getting a uh, real uh, experience within the workplace. Um, and so, like I said, this can be done in various different sectors. Uh, but the nice thing to know is through, through those first two semesters and through a career management service team is there's a formula for you to go through as an MBA student to get prepared. And a lot of time gets spent around teaching you um, uh, career skills that you'll take on not only um, into your law uh, portion of your degree, but afterwards, regardless if you work more on the business side or in the legal profession. So there's career um, um, elements to our program that can really help you regardless of which way you end up going. Um, and like I said, so you're working for those eight months and then following that you would do your first year of your law degree. And then in the Sec or the third and fourth year is when you do uh, the combined courses and you take our three capstone courses, uh, two are focused more on strategy. And then you'd also take four CRMB electives. We have, um, and our four electives can be found in different areas of focus. So we have a finance area focus, entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, marketing, and then data analytics. So depending on your interest, you're able to pick and choose your electives based on your uh, career interests. Um, in terms of admissions, we have uh, three admissions deadlines this year. So January 15th is the first one, February 28th is the second one, and then May 7th is the third one. Uh, in terms of requirements, uh, we're looking for a 3.0 GPA or better a letter of intent, two academic letters of reference, and a resume. Um, our program has chose to waive the standardized test requirements. So typically if you're applying to both programs, we could just use your LSAT uh, mark uh, for our program, uh, but that is not required this year for our program. So we don't need to worry about that. Uh, if you're an international student, we would be looking at an IELTS of seven or above and a, a letter of financial guarantee. So that's kind of our um, uh, requirements uh, in terms of application. Uh, if you're planning to apply and uh, wish to be considered for scholarships, um, there's two scholarship deadlines uh, in each of the first two rounds. Uh, so if you apply before those first two rounds and complete the scholarship application, which is on our website, uh, you'll be considered for a scholarship. Um, in terms of, you know, deciding whether or not it's a good fit for you, my biggest recommendations to students is to reach out directly. Um, like Grady said, we'll have our contact information in the chat box. Um, and I'm happy to set up a conversation and talk more about the program, but also my biggest, uh, you know, thing I like to do with prospective students is connect them with one of our current uh, JD MBA students because I think it would be a, uh, a great uh, thing and a great way to figure out if the joint programs for you is connecting there. And at that, I will, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to go over to MHA with, um, the illustrious Michael Haskis. Well, thank you, Randy. Um, 
It's my pleasure to say a few words about the JDMHA program. The program basically prepares students to play a critical role in healthcare delivery as lawyers, policymakers, or health executives. The need for individuals who can effectively navigate the legal complexities of healthcare is best exemplified by the difficult legal issues posed by COVID-19 pandemic and the demand for health leaders to guide us through its many challenges. The career doors that the program can open is likely top of mind to you. So let me start by identifying some specific career options before describing the structure of the program. So this program prepares you for private practice, uh, private legal practice representing health professionals, healthcare institutions, and healthcare consumers. You can be in-house counsel for healthcare facilities, such as hospitals and nursing home organizations. You can also be a government lawyer who provides advice to departments or ministries of health. Another opportunity is to work for healthcare NGOs or non-governmental organizations, such as the Red Cross and the World Health Organization. You may choose to take on a healthcare executive position such as being the vice president of patient safety and risk management for a hospital. While the combined program prepares you for these types of careers, you should know, you should know that you will earn a general JD degree and will be exposed to many different areas of law, not just health law. Thus, you will be entitled to practice any type of law and you will be in no way limited to legal positions related to healthcare if your career ultimately takes you in another direction. In terms of the program overview, it takes four years to complete. It would take significantly longer to undertake a JD and an MHA separately. In year one, students have the option of completing the first year either at the School Health Administration which would involve taking first year MHA courses and then following the first year doing a four month paid MHA residency during the summer. In terms of MHA courses, they cover the type of topics that health leaders need to know. For example, healthcare law, healthcare economics, healthcare policy, human resources and healthcare, quality management in healthcare, statistics for health administration, and many other areas. Regarding the residency, it involves being paired with a healthcare agency that is usually selected based on consultation with the students and considering their interest and career goals. Okay, so that's the first option for year one. You may choose on the other hand to complete your first year of the JD program at the law school. And it involves the exact same courses that all JD students complete whether or not they are pursuing a combined program. Okay, so that's year one and those are your two options in year one. In year two, students complete the first year of whatever program they did not elect to begin with in year one. For example, if you do first year MHA in year one, which I must say is the typical approach, then you would spend year two at the law school doing all the first year JD courses. On the other hand, if you do first year JD courses in year one, then you will spend year two at the School of Health Administration and the following summer is when you would complete the residency requirement. So those are years one and two. Years three and four then involve taking upper year courses in both schools. So you take a smattering of courses in both programs in years three and four. In terms of admission requirements, um, you should know that you need to apply to the law school and the school health administration separately. You must meet the admission requirements of each school. Note though that you only need to write the LSAT, not the GMAT. The GMAT is only required for students who are interested in the MHA program only. 
if you say to the school health administration that you're interested in the joint program or the combined program, they will accept the ELSA and you need not write the GMAT. You should consult each school for particular requirements such as personal statements, letters of reference, university transcripts, etc. A question that's often asked is, what happens if I apply to both schools but I only get into one? Is it still possible to do the combined program? And the answer is yes. This scenario typically plays out with students being accepted to the MHA program but not the JD program. In that case, you can reapply to the law school during your first year of the MHA. So you would undertake the MHA. During that first year, you reapply. And if you get into the law school, you then can do the combined program. And this has certainly happened in the past, particularly where a student has rewritten the LSAT during the first year of the MHA and obtained a higher score and or where a student's first term MAJ grades boost their GPA sufficiently high so that they gain entrance to the law school. Here's a few additional things you should know about the combined program. Dow is the only one to offer such a program, the combined JD MHA. You earn two separate degrees. You get a JD degree and a Master of Health Administration degree. There is no such thing as a JD MHA degree. You get two separate degrees. The program is open to anyone with an undergraduate degree in any discipline. You do not need a healthcare background. None of the courses assume such a background. And many students um, don't have any experience um, with healthcare, either studying it or um, practicing it. Healthcare law um, as well, you should know, is one of the key areas of specialization for the law school. And the law school hosts the Dalhousie Health Law Institute. So there's lots of health law expertise at your disposal in the combined program. In terms of the MHA requirements, combined students can choose to do an MHA thesis or complete the MHA through coursework only. Lastly, I note that the MHA program is accredited through the Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Management Education, also known as CAMI. This is an interna internationally recognized accrediting body. The School Health of Men is only one of three such programs um, with this accreditation in Canada. So those are my opening remarks about the JDMHA program. I'd be delighted to field any questions that you have during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, so now we're going to move on to our Masters of Information uh, with Janet Music. Hi there, you can hear me okay? We can. Okay, perfect. So hello, my name is Janet Music and I am the program coordinator over at the School of Information Management. Um, specifically, our degree is the Master of Information. Um, the name is new, but the degree is uh, quite well established. So the degree is 50 years old. Uh, SIM has been around for quite a while. Um, but as Dr. Devlin was saying at the beginning of this session, our world is a lot more complex than it was 50 years ago. And so we changed the name to reflect that. So we're not just training librarians, we're training information managers. So with this degree, we're really trying to launch people's careers so that they can have a strong relationship with their clients, whether they're business, government, non-profit. We will connect you with alumni. We have a very strong alumni base. And we also have strong ties to different professional communities that um, I will talk about in a moment. But currently we are one of eight programs in Canada that have the American Library Association accreditation. Uh, every seven years, we go through quite a significant process to 
updated the degree to ensure that we meet with internationally renowned standards so that you know that your degree is uh, transferable. So if you want to take your Master of Information degree and your JD degree and work in Scotland, you still will be accredited there. So our degree is really interdisciplinary. So we get a lot of undergrads coming right into the program, um, not a lot of work experience. That's not necessary. So we do have some um, older students, but uh, generally speaking, it's an interdisciplinary degree. Um, and it has a lot of different uh, courses that you can take. So if you are interested in risk management, if you're interested in privacy, if you're interested in information technology, or you're interested in uh, legal librarianship, we have core and uh, elective courses that would satisfy your interest in all of those areas. And so a big part of our degree is the practicum placement. And so I'm in the process of doing that now. Each cohort is about 40 students. So currently in our school, we have just under 100 students and every one of them is required, uh, including the combined JD and my students to do a practicum placement. And of interest to our uh, legal scholars, uh, generally, that takes place at a legal law firm uh, library or a legislative library, um, but it doesn't have to. So we also have placements that take place in government records management, in the Department of Justice, uh, KPMG. So we have a lot of, and of course, libraries uh, and museums, but we have a lot of partners in these areas. So it's really where you want to take this degree. It's quite flexible. So similar to the uh, MHA and the JD, you, are, you can choose to do this course in two ways. So you can either start off in the MI um, and you do your core courses. So we have uh, eight core courses altogether. So you would do your first semester uh, four core courses and your second semester would be uh, two core courses and a couple of electives. And then you would move over to the JD. This is a four year program. So uh, you're saving some time by doing a combined degree for sure. In total, you're gonna do 12 uh, courses through your MI and 79 to 83 JD credit courses. So Randy can answer those questions about the JD courses, um, but that's typically how it takes place. Um, and so really our alumni in this area, they go on to be legal librarians, uh, internet or media lawyers, intellectual property lawyers, uh, federal or provincial clerks. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity. So in terms of the mechanics, we, uh, if you're applying to the program, so you have to apply for both programs. There is no GRE or GMAT. Uh, you would have to take the LSATs course. Um, but really, if you want to, um, uh, the scholarship deadline is March 1st, so you would have to get your application in by that time to be qualifying for scholarships. Uh, but it's been a strange year, so COVID is, is really kind of blown up our deadline. So if you feel like, you know, you get to July and you still haven't decided what you want to do with your life and you're still considering grad school, you can reach out to me and we can chat about some of your options for that. Um, the typical student coming in has a 3.3 GPA in their undergrad. Um, that's competitive. The cutoff is 3.0. Uh, the IELTS score is a bit higher than the Dalhousie average. Uh, we have it at an 8.0 and that's because there's a lot of uh, reading requirements in our course and it, you really need to have a command of the English language when you're doing this degree. Just want to set you up for success. Um, and really I'd just be happy to answer any questions you might have about our degree in the question period but I think that covers everything that we want to say. Perfect. Thank you so much, Janet. And uh, last but certainly not least, our MPA uh, with Krista. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. You can hear me. We can. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I'm with the School of Public Admin, and the MPA program um, would be an excellent choice if you were looking to do uh, to combine some advanced skills in policy analysts and now, sorry, analysis and management with training and law. Um, I'll talk about our admissions. Our admissions, we look to have a 3.3 GPA coming in and we accept all backgrounds, so all degrees are, are welcome. Um, you need two academic references and we accept the LSTATs in place of the GMAT and the GRE for international students. Um, I think that's it. We need a letter of intent and a CV from you for the, the complete application package. Um, our program is 13, 13 courses and the first year of the program uh, you would complete eight core courses. And then the remaining four, no, the remaining five would be do, you could do an internship during the summer before you start in at the law, with the law school. Um, no. <laughs> so our, um, our internship is, is competitive based, but we give you all the background in a professional development program that you will need to take during the first year as well. Um, so for instance, we have alumni who are currently working in areas, um, we have some alumni working with uh, the Dalhousie University. Uh, Janet Music is one of our alum. Um, we have uh, alum working in the university secretariat. We also have alum in foreign affairs and trade and development Canada. So there's, there's many areas that you could go with this MPA JD degree. Um, we are accredited with CAPA, and that's the Canadian Association of Programs in Public Policy. Uh, a lot of things have been said <laughs> throughout this, everyone. <laughs> and uh, so I'm not sure, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that may come up. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, there, there, one of the things that you'll find throughout these is that there is a lot of overlap in um, kind of some of the, the criteria when it comes to applying and, and kind of where you can go. Kind of overall, you do have to apply to each program separately, regardless of which um, program it is. You are accepted to each program separately and then um, you become part of the combined program. If you, you know, as, as was mentioned previously, if you were accepted to one program and not the other, um, depending on the circumstance, you can always talk to us and there, there's usually the potential to be able to apply again, um, kind of while you're working on the first year of the other degree. Um, one qualifier, I, I will just kind of say, because I know, again, all of our programs are, are different. Um, the JD, we still will require the LSATs. Uh, there is no if, ands, or buts about that. Um, but, you know, as, as mentioned, some of the other programs will accept the LSAT in lieu of another test. Um, so it is really important to kind of take a look at the other uh, programs to see kind of what their criteria are. And in the chat, I've put in links to all the different websites and uh, email addresses as well. Uh, we're gonna get ready to kind of open this up for questions. So please, as I mentioned, just you know, put things in the chat um, if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, so please don't be shy. And again, thank you to everyone uh, who is here tonight for this session um, and 
kind of while waiting for some questions to come in, if anybody is a current applicant or is interested in one program or another, if you just want to throw that in the chat just so we have kind of an idea of our, our breakdowns and in, in our, who are participants and who are audiences tonight. Okay, so we do have a question here about um, how many students are typically in the JD MPA program each year? Krista, do you have a good sense of kind of? Um, well, this incoming year we have one that is will be will be going to the JD program in September. Um, we have currently, I think five or six in the program right, right at the moment. Perfect. And just um, while we're waiting for other questions in, is there a sense from the other programs as well as to kind of the current numbers of, of how many are usually in uh, participating every year? We usually get the MIJD, we usually have at least one person per intake, um, sometimes more. Okay. Uh, for us, oh, sorry, who else is talking? Uh, for us, I mean, I think there's usually a handful of students. Um, like I said, I think there's about six in second year and maybe one or two, but possibly three that's applying uh, in first year right now. So I'd say about a handful each year. Perfect. Okay, for the MHJ, um, JD, in the first First year MHA, there's typically about 15 to 20 students in the first year. Of them, there's usually around three or four um, JD MHA combined students. And then the rest of the course will be just MHA only students. Perfect, thank you. And one thing I will kind of note, the majority of the people who, uh, who participate in our combined programs, they typically start with the master's portion first before coming over to JD, you know, um, and so in those situations, we do our best if the, um, you know, two or three people coming from a certain program want to be kind of put together. If we have those requests before we build our first year class, uh, we can never make any guarantees, but we do our best to kind of keep everyone together um, because you know you, you make friends and we want to make sure that you are supported as possible throughout your JD. Um, so we have a question here um, about the MBA program. Um, the question is, did you say that the GPA requirement was a 4.0? And if the GPA requirement is not met, what can compensate for the low GPA? Uh, so our GPA requirement is 3.0 uh, in terms of the way our application process works. If you meet the minimum requirement, we push you on to the second phase. So you meet the minimum requirement and then submit all of your additional documents. Then you would go on to the second portion, which is a scored interview. Uh, and that's the second portion. And if you pass that scored interview, uh, then we look at that point, we would look at your whole file. Um, if you have below a 3.0, um, there is a couple students that may get in at the end, but typically students, um, the average incoming GPA is, you know, a 3.3 to 3.6, uh, typically. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and one thing I will note, because I, I realized I, I had not said it before, for the JD program, the average GPA for successful candidates typically sits around a 3.7 on the 4.3 scale. Uh, we don't really have a minimum cutoff. Uh, we only ever kind of track our averages. Um, so now uh, we have a question in about the MHA program. Uh, and is healthcare law also focused on for the JD MHA? Okay, yeah, so at, um, in terms of the MHA courses, in the first year of the MHA, there's a mandatory health law course, three credit course, um, which I teach. Um, on the law school side of things, your first year law, all the curriculum is totally set for all students, whether you're an MHA student or an MPA student, it doesn't matter, all JD students do the same first year curriculum. 
And there are some courses in that first year that do touch on health law. But in terms of getting specialized in health law courses, that occurs in the upper year JD courses. So that'd be years three and four of the combined program. You'd be selecting among a number of different, in fact, a wide slate of uh, health law courses because health law is an area of specialization for the law school. So there's lots of those courses and you can take certainly some of them. I do caution students in the combined program to try to make sure they take a nice cross section of courses, not just healthcare. So as I said before, when you graduate with your JD, you can practice in any area of law that you want, health law or otherwise. As a result of that, you do want to take a whole bunch of different other courses like labor law, family law, criminal law, and other sorts of courses as well, not just health law courses, but for sure, there's a healthy number of health law courses, no pun intended. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so question um, here is coming in about um, assuming acceptance to, to kind of both programs, what, uh, is there a process to inform the law school of the com combination since the start date would move from fall 2021 to fall 2022 for the JD? Um, yes, um, essentially, we just ask that you kind of keep us informed uh, by emailing law.admissions at dal.ca. So when you get an offer from us, um, you can kind of let us know that you are a combined applicant uh, because it can also affect your deposit. So for the JD, the way that you secure your seat is by you by paying a $500 uh, non-refundable deposit that is credited towards your fees. If you've already been accepted to one of the uh, combined programs, you don't have to pay that fee for the law school because you're starting with the other program. Um, so that's a benefit by telling us right away. Uh, but essentially, you just let us know, you know, if you have already been accepted to us and you get an offer from the other school, just let us know and we will help you with the paperwork. It's a really simple form. Um, and basically, the, the process is fairly simple about uh, once you've been accepted to being coming part of the combined program and deferring your JD offer. All right, so we have a question about the uh, JD MPA. Um, so for the MPA, uh, where would you say most people go for their work periods? Um, well, this year we have, it depends, it really depends year to year. We had a lot of students that actually stayed in Halifax this year and they worked with the provincial and the federal government. We had a few go to Ottawa. Um, if there are positions out west, you could go up there, you go out west, and it's usually anywhere the three levels of government. Um, because it's a competitive nature, I was just pulling up my sheet to see where our jobs came from, the ads, and last summer we had Global Affairs, Parks Canada, Health Canada, DND, um, the Ontario Provincial Government, Agriculture, Agri-Foods, agri ACOA, the list goes on. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have a question here. Um, I'm in my second year of the MI program on the fence about applying for the combined JD program. Is it too late to apply for the JD combined? I will personally vouch for Alexis. She's wonderful. <laughs> and I know she's been thinking about doing the law degree for a while. We had this conversation quite a while ago. Um, and I'm a big dreamer. So I, I feel like if you can dream it, you can do it. So maybe we should talk offline about this. Because there's a lot of timing to go with this, Alexis. Like it's, there's lot LSATs and applications and I don't know that there's an easy answer for that one. Yeah, because usually, at least from, from my perspective, because um, there's a lot of factors in, involved. I mean, you can still at this point, you know, apply for the JD and we would take um, your, your MI marks into consideration for sure. Whether or not the timing works 
to be able to get the benefit of doing it as a combined program is hard to say uh, because the benef the real benefit of the combined program is that you're kind of doing them at the same time. Um, so yes, so um, please reach out to, to Janet and, and myself and we can definitely have that conversation and, and see if it is still feasible at this point, but you can still definitely be considered for the JD and I actually think I was looking at your application um starting that process maybe no wait no we've talked though sorry it's been a, it's been a day <laughs> all right next question um is what do tuition fees look like for these programs is it substantially more expensive for a combined for the combined years um three and four it looks like it it from the website um yeah but essentially for it, it can vary a bit depending on funding and things like that, but essentially, yes, um, you're basically paying for each independent program. So the, you are paying to do an, uh, like a, a master's degree and you're paying to do the JD. You just get the benefit of saving a year or saving however long it takes. Um, I will put in the chat um, the um the fee schedule that is provided by the university um, and if you have questions um you can always reach out as well to our student accounts um, because they are the ones that set the fees and can give you a good breakdown of them all right so the next question from the JD program FAQs, um, for your GPA, we take into consideration either your overall GPA or your last 10 credits. The last 10 credits, if you're looking at the Dalhousie scale, essentially is your last 20 courses. Uh, one credit is, or one course, half of a credit. Um, so for us, when we look at your GPA, um, it is either focused on cumulatively or the most recent two years worth of courses, which is roughly about 20 courses. And whichever one of those is highest is the one we will use in your assessment. Thank you everyone for these, these questions um, as they're coming in. All right, another one about the JD. Um, for the two references needed, it says both should be academic. If one cannot provide two, uh, please explain why. I was wondering if I was able to provide one academic reference and one professional reference, uh, would I be penalized for doing so? Um, it, it, no, um, is, is quite, kind of the short answer for that. Uh, the reason we prefer and have the requirement of two academic references is that they can kind of speak to your performance and your academic history, um, which is kind of one of the main things that we use, or not one of the main, but one of the things that we use in assessing your application. Um, if you are in a position when you cannot secure two and you've been in school uh, within three years of applying, we just kind of want the context so that the committee can understand the reasoning as to just being like, you know, for some people, if they have an online course or an online degree, it's hard to get and build those relationships. So it's just being able to provide the context. Um, as I like to say, uh, control the narrative. All right. So uh, another question, uh, what is the, the probability for a full scholarship or obtaining student loans for an international interested, uh, for international interested applicants? Um, I think it depends on each program. I'm gonna flip this to the floor to see if anyone has any specific information from their perspectives. Uh, I can go. In terms of our program, we have um, a number of entrance scholarships uh, available that uh, international students would would uh, be considered for. Um, they range between five to fifteen thousand, so it wouldn't be a full scholarship, but it would be a scholarship. Sure, thank you. Um, I know from kind of the the JD perspective. 
Um, we have a number of entrance scholarships that, you know, so if you've been accepted to the combined program and you're deferring your offer, uh, when you defer your offer, kind of the way it works is usually in November, uh, kind of of that year, we will send you a renewed offer. And at that point, you would be applying for entrance scholarships. So there is the potential to get funding for at least that portion. And the majority of our entrance scholarships are available to international applicants. Uh, once you're at the law school, there's additional funding opportunities as well throughout your first, second, and third. Well, if you're in the combined, it'd be potentially your second, third, and fourth year. Um, in terms of um, the MHA, um, there are uh, a limited number of relatively modest scholarships, entrance scholarships for the MHA pro program, and they would not uh, at all approach the, a full scholarship. Um, and then Brandy just spoke to the JD side of things. Perfect. All right, so the next um, we have here, um, I've been admitted to the JD program, congratulations, uh, but I'm considering now applying to the MI, it sounds fantastic. Another scholarship question, I've already applied for entrance scholarships for the JD program. If hypothetically I were to get a scholarship for the JD program and get admitted to the MI program, would I forfeit that scholarship? Uh, and uh, the, the answer is, is, is yes, um, for that year. We do not defer scholarships um, for the basic reason of, um, you know, you would have the potential of, of when you apply again uh, or when you um, are offered again to potentially get a bigger scholarship. Uh, so we don't want to secure that money for the next year uh, to, so that you have the opportunity to potentially get a better scholarship opportunity. But Thanks. you will ha have the chance to be able to apply for other JD scholarships when you start. But if a student gets a JD scholarship and uh, not an MI scholarship, though we do have some scholarships um, available on our website, uh, could they potentially start the JD program first to keep their scholarship for that year and then do the MI? So um, the way I understand it, um, the JD scholarships would only be able to cover the years of doing the JD. So if they were to start with the JD, um, it would pay for that year and then um, it depends on the scholarship in question, but if they go to do the MI, then that wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be covered during that year. Another reason that it's, a, it, it's great to start with your master's program. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, do you look at the undergrad, or do you look at the graduate degree, uh, degrees, GPA, or, or only the undergrad? Um, I'll start uh, with, quickly with, um, from the JD perspective, and then we'll flip it uh, for the other departments, but for us, we do take graduate GPAs into consideration um, as well as your undergrads. So I will go. Um, I believe FGS just considers undergrad uh, marks for master's degrees. So even if you have another master's degree, because the scale is different, so an undergrad scale goes from, uh, you know, an F to a D, CBA. Graduate degrees typically only go to B to an A, so it's not really a comparable so a C in an undergrad would be a failure in a graduate. So it's, you're not comparing like to like. So generally speaking, um, we get the applications first. We do the GPA calculation. Now, if your GPA does not hit 3.0, which is the minimum cutoff, but you have a graduate degree with excellent marks, we will take that in, into consideration when we send everything up to FGS because they get the final word. 
Um, so we all look at your whole package, your essay that you write, your resume, your references. Um, but really, for uh, to get into the MI, and I, I believe it's for all the uh, graduate at Dell, uh, your undergrad is the one that is the main GPA calculation. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so the next question, um, MBA has a lower GPA requirement than the JD program, so does applying for a combined program in increase the odds of admission in comparison to applying to the JD program alone? Um, at least from the JD perspective, not really, um, in that we don't talk to the other departments. Um, during the application process. Um, although this does remind me, if anybody, sorry, I'm going on tangent, I apologize. If anybody is applying to another, to a master's program and would like their LSAT to be considered um, instead of, an, in lieu of another test for those that will accept it, you have to, you have to email us at the uh, law.admissions at dal.ca uh, to give us permission to share your LSAT score. So that is very important. Um, so I'm glad I remembered that. Um, but going back on topic, um, we don't really talk between us because our, our application processes are separate. And as such, um, we, we all have our own different criteria as they were mentioned. Um, the, the benefit comes in is that say you know you were accepted to the MBA or MHJ or you know MI or MPA and not to the JD program you could start that degree and then reapply to the JD program and we would use those marks as you're getting them um, from your masters in your in your calculation because we do use graduate marks and that will help Kind of bolster your GPA, um, which will help your chances of getting in on your second round. And did anyone want to, to add anything to that? Is that right? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think you hit like, you know, all the points in terms of, you know, the processes uh, in terms of getting into our program. Uh, is very, uh, it's separate into each program. So the idea is you apply to both programs, it's a separate application to both. And then, you know, then you let us know that you wanna be considered as a joint student. So um, yeah, the GPA is a requirement. I'd say there's, you know, a handful of students each, each year that are taking our program and then trying to reapply to law school and, and get in. So it's a common practice to try while you're in your MBA. Perfect, thank you. All right, the so next question, um, does Dahazi receive um, reserve seats in the JD program for student for students from Atlantic Canada? Uh, for us, when we build our first year class, our first year class is um, typically 170 students. Uh, we pull from, we try to pull roughly about 50-50 from two different applicant pools. We have our resident applicant pool, which is anybody from the Atlantic provinces and from the territories, and then we have uh, everybody else. So just based on the number of, um, kind of the, the, the number of applicants per pool, you do have a slight benefit um, being from the Atlantic region, but over the last couple of years, the stats, the average LSAT and average GPA has been very similar for each applicant pool, um, but we don't necessarily reserve seats. We try to aim for a 40, 40 to 50% being from the Atlantic region. Do, do the other programs um, kind of have any kind of um, process like that? Um, well, the MI program, we don't have a, a quota system per se. Um, 
It really depends on the size of the amount of applicants. Uh, 40 people in a cohort is a comfortable cohort. Um, if we get larger than that, then classes start to become, lose that intimacy of having a graduate level class. Um, but it's hard to predict, right? So some years you get many, many applications and then some years you don't. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that when you're applying, just make your best application and uh, go from there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about the competition. It is competitive, but it, you, know, you can't do anything about that. So you just have to work on making the best and strongest application that you can. Yeah, the MHA program also does not have any quotas. Um, you know, as I say, we have a first year cohort of about 25 students and, uh, and so yeah, you just make your, put in your best application and, and uh, we assess it on uh, an individual basis. Perfect. Yeah, I was gonna say same for us, no specific quota for any area. All right. And it's the same for the MPA. We don't have any specific quota. Perfect. Sometimes I just like asking questions that I don't know the answers to. So thank you. I'm learning so much tonight. Um, secretly the reason we did it. No, it's not. Um, so next question I'm uh, going to open up to, to everyone um, is how does retaking an undergrad class look on an application if the grade is low on the first time? Um, example, if you have a C minus and then retake the course and get an A. So this, I think, is one of those other the technical questions that would have to do with graduate studies. And I don't know that we can double count a course. So I actually don't even, if you go to Dalhousie, you think you can take the same course twice. Um, you can, if you fail the course and get an F, you can retake it. But if you get a grade you don't like, I don't think you can take the same course with the same code. So uh, I don't know, that's not come up in the time that I've been doing this. So I, I can't say for sure. Um, certainly an A looks better than a C minus, but Similar to the JD, at the MI, we count the last 20 credits. So they have to be upper level courses, you know, 3,000 and 4,000 levels. So even if you took, a, you know, a course in your second year and you got a C minus, we're not going to probably look at that anyway, as long as you have 20 credits that are 3,000 and above, right? So that's a very technical question that I think would have to be looked at person to person. I don't necessarily know what the answer to that is. Okay. Um, I will speak quickly to that about the JD. Um, when it comes to retaking courses, we won't look at your second mark. We will only ever take the original grade in your calculations. The committee will see it and as part of our holistic review, they'll be able to see the improvement, but you know, for an academic assessment, it is always the original mark. So we always recommend that if you are looking to upgrade your GPA, um, that your best bet is really to take additional or new courses rather than retaking old ones. Um, but yeah. All right, so question here. Uh, hi, I am interested in the JD MBA program. Does the program slash university help you with networking and career guide while um, we are in school? Thank you. Awesome. Um, actually, I think uh, the first day, I think the part of the title of the first day of orientation is, is networking. So, um, you know, our uh, director, Dan, would say that if you don't know how to network at the end of an MBA, you're never going to know how to network. So they, it's definitely a primary focus 
of the program and something that they um, help our students develop because there's obviously you could say the word and tell yourself you need to network but there's the skills that come along with that so I'd say a big part of our MBA program is teaching you the career skills such as networking um, we also do you know first part of the program starts off with, you know, strength based testing, personality testing, getting to know your goals, all those kinds of things. And then figuring out how our career management service team and the program can help you reach those goals. Um, you know, and like I said, that career management service team, you know, helps you through the process of applying to your corporate residency and that process of going through and getting prepared for that interview. So it's doing such as, such as interview prep, cover letter prep, all of those things that you'll take on post MBA portion of your degree, um, will be beneficial. Um, so that I'd say there's a, a high level of focus on that uh, career networking. We have a module based program that runs throughout our program that's uh, uh, focused on management and leadership skills as well. So that's a big focus um, that you would be able to uh, take as a MBA student as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and from the JD kind of perspective on that, uh, we do have a dedicated career development team that will help you kind of throughout the process, whether it is for networking or for uh, resumes, interview prep. Um, we do a lot of mock interviews. Uh, but one thing I will say, as soon as our, our career team finds out that somebody is in the joint programs, but, you know, you know, as, as Jenna was saying, with, with the MBA, uh, they're not worried uh, because they will have picked up at least some of, or most of, all of the skills needed for, for networking before they even get to the, to the law school. I don't know if any of us can answer that question for the law school. Um, Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but what I missed, sorry. You cut off halfway through. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, for, 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 for us, we have a great career development office that will help uh, throughout the entire time you're here with us, um, but they definitely don't need to worry as much when it comes to our combined students because, you know, they get a lot of that experience on the master's side, um, but they're, they're here to help throughout. Sorry about that. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, and I'll just uh, cut in here with regard to the uh, Master's Health Administration. Uh, yes, there's lots of help with networking. We have uh, an executive in residence position. So we have a prominent healthcare leader who works with the students in all years of the MHA in terms of connecting them with people they should be speaking to and giving career advice and running uh, mock interviews and all those sorts of things. So there's lots of networking uh, opportunities and, and lots of ways to get you prepared to um, um, hit the bricks looking for a position. Perfect. Did anybody else? Yeah. And um, was there any kind of last minute questions? Um, I unfortunately lost my, my chat history when um, my, my, my thing caught up. <laughs> I don't see any, Randy. I, the okay. last entry is I think you're caught up. Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so unless there's any um, last questions that were coming in, I again want to thank everyone for coming and I'm going to put everybody on the spot right now. And um, if you have um, any last uh, information or advice that you would like to share with our participants, um, Mike, you're, you're currently big on my screen. So I'm going to put you, put you on the spot first. Um, okay, I, I don't think I mentioned um, in my main presentation application deadlines. Randy can give you the JD deadlines uh, for the MHA. Um, the deadline, if you want to be cons considered for scholarships, is April 1 to apply for the MHA. Um, if you don't meet the April 1 deadline, um, it is not at all uncommon to accept applications after April 1st. 
and sometimes it can go well into the summer when we accept applications. That's on the MHA side. On the JD side, though, um, the tie lines are a little bit tighter. And uh, did you already speak to those, Rand? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, our final application deadline is February 28th. We just had our early admissions deadline uh, yesterday. Um, um, anyone that met that deadline will be considered for early admissions and scholarship consideration. And uh, the end of our process, uh, all decisions are made by the end of June. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think for for us, uh, I just want to thank everyone for for coming out. I think you know next steps for us if you're interested in our program is uh, reaching out to myself. Uh, and if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I am planning to update our events page on our website with um, some more information se sessions specific to our program come the winter months. So that's something to look forward to. Um, we've been able to host uh, some virtual classrooms. So having prospective students drop in on current uh, classes as well. So that's something that I'm hoping to do next semester as well. So um, yeah, I look forward to keeping in touch uh, with all the students interested in the MBA uh, JD program. And I guess for, you know, what we like to say at SIM is that we're a small school, but, you know, we, we like to think big. And so if you're really considering at all doing a joint program to reach out and if you have any further questions in the winter, I believe it's February, we will be having an open house, which is quite similar to what we're doing here, but just, uh, just am I. So I, you're welcome to come to that. And uh, of course, check the website and send me any um, questions you may have with the program. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thanks, Erin. This was very interesting. I learned a lot as well. Interested in the uh, MHA, <laughs> personally. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a great program for myself. <laughs> Our application deadline is June the 1st, but we do accept into the into the summer. Um, so if you would like to reach out, you can reach out to me and you can reach out to the Dow MPA account. Um, we're also having a conference in January if you want to attend and it's a student led conference. You're more than welcome. The information will be on our website. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Um, if you have any questions about the JD, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our email address is law.admissions at dal.ca. I will say because of our deadline uh, that just passed, um, please be patient with responses, uh, but we will definitely reach out and, and are happy to talk to anybody uh, that has questions. Um, but yeah, and I want to thank again our, our lovely uh, panel uh, who will have shared a lot of information. I know I also learned a lot. And um, yeah, thank you again for everyone uh, who came out tonight. Great, take care. Hi everyone. Thanks Randy.